Hey guys, for those of you who are at the show of shows or you watch my video about the show of shows, it turns out I've been holding out on you. That's right. I picked up a gun that I told no one about. No one at the show knew about it other than my own crew. Um, and when I found out about it, my hands were shaking, I could barely function. So you better have a seat for this one because I'm gonna rock your world. Stay tuned. I picked up a Kriegoff, and you can see right here, that's the early logo. You can also see that it's a G date or a G code, which they only made, uh, theoretically they made from one to 99. And what is the serial number? That's right, zero one. Right here, zero one. And right here, zero one. And right here, zero one. And throughout the entire gun, every place that there should be a serial number, that's right, this is Kriegoff number one. Now you know why I was so excited. First and foremost, and I was just telling Logan, who's filling in with Rand for Randy, by the way, uh, that the most important part of this, because uh, whenever you find a gun like this, the value accelerates so much, you have to make sure that it's authentic. Uh, so we have the story behind the gun, and I have, I have a gun that I can compare it to, a couple guns that we can compare it to. So let's take a closer look at the gun itself, and then let's uh, hear the story behind where this gun came from. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, gun number 01, first and foremost, and compare it. Now, when I did a video called The Development of the Kriegoff, I showed you starting at number 95 because I owned this gun already. This is a G code, and this is number 95. It has the early logo. Here's a, here's a 37 just to show you a later logo. Later logo they have Kriegoff and Sewell. Over here, they have just Sewell. You can also see where somebody used this as a hammer. <laughs> somebody put little dings all over in it, but you can see that they numbered the toggle here. The early S code, they did that, but then after that, they stopped numbering the toggle in that way. You'll also notice the biggest, um, I'm gonna say, concern that I have about this G code, uh, this G, as you can see, is very thin. Now the Mauser's G, this is a Mauser. Most of you know Mauser, G date, which is 1935. This G is a lot thinner than the Mauser G. So if somebody wanted to fake it and they took a Mauser G and, and put the Kriegoff toggle on it, the G would not be right. This is a thinner G on number 95. And again, they went from one to 99 with the G code, 1935, and then they went to an S code. I'm giving you a lot of information, but stick with me because I, I want to show you uh, on this one, the G is obviously much bigger. The uh, logo is correct and the serial numbering is all correct and the serial numbering on the back is correct. The other thing is the wooden grips. The early ones had the wooden grips, and again, if you're used to Craig Offs, you're used to these reddish grips, and that's what they would have on the 36, 37, and reddish grip, and then by 1940, they went to a black grip. But let's go back to these wooden grips. So we'll do the uh, number one. You can see that this, uh, see the wooden grip. First of all, the checkering is a little bit wider, and the grips are a little bit wider. Let's compare it to, remember, the Mauser G-Date? Uh, Mauser grips are a little bit thinner than the Kriegoff grip. So right here you can see it the most. Uh, these are a little thinner, this is a little thicker. When you hold it in your hand, you can feel the girth. I hesitate to say that's what she said, but I'm just gonna move right on. You can feel the girth on this one, it's a little bit wider. So these are definitely Kriegoff grips, as are the grips on number 95. A little bit thicker. This finish, is a little duller, you can see it right here. Uh, but the numbering, you're not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna be able to show you all the little minutia because it's not, it's not well marked. Somebody put the white wax in here so you can see it, but this is exactly the same. It only has the uh, diameter marking and the Kriegoff proof marking. 
And then here they have the serial number and that's all the same. But you can see that this is a little bit of duller finish. Now these differences would be expected. If this is number one, obviously it's a prototype, it's experimental. The G is a little bit different, but it's not a Mauser G. Some of you are thinking right away, can't be right because that's a Mauser G. It is not a Mauser G. It's actually closer to a Mauser G. It's a little bit bigger. If you look at the cross hatch right here, this is a stamp. And I'm not sure this is stamped or not. I tried to take the white wax out. It's actually a paint. But there is a, we'll call that a table, right there on the G. And over here, it's a lot smaller. Um, I looked at it under magnification. You'll take my word for it. it. This is not the same G as a Mauser G. But it also is clearly not the same G as you find on number 95. So the G is a little bit different. Everything else looks exactly the same. Let me show you one other thing that I notice. When I first saw this one, number one, and you'll see where I saw it at the show, I looked at it at the show and I said, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, stood out as this has to be right. And one thing that bothered me a little bit is every, every Luger that I have ever seen, it's not white here, this is in the white. But every, every Luger that I check, this is blued. So I'm talking about right here and right here, they're blued. Let's just take a quick look at this Kragoff. But if I look at a thousand Lugers, they're blued, blued, white, white. When I pulled out number 95 after I got home, because I, I didn't have anything to compare it to, there, believe me, there's no other G code in that show. Uh, there's probably only about 15 known. Um, by the way, these sell anywhere from 30,000 to 50,000 just because they're so rare. But you'll see white, 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 white. So I don't know what to make of that. This is white, but right here you can see it's blued. So I believe that was just a poor finish and wore off a little bit. These uh, straw parts are all correct where they're supposed to be straw. And by the way, if you want to heat something up to make it straw, if you heat it too much, it turns blue. And you do see in, in some of these spots, you do see a little bit of a, like right up in here, I see a little bit of blue, uh, but it's, it's mostly uh, straw. Also, you can see that this is aged. It's a darker color. I believe that they originally had uh, the white in the markings on the top, because this one has the same thing. But I think somebody added this because this is bright white. Notice that bright white, that usually means it was applied recently as opposed to this white which has yellowed over time. Notice the difference. That's a good indicator. People tell me, can I take all this white stuff out? Well, be careful because I think this is original. I think this is original and this is original and this is what it should look like. It's an aged yellowed white. So I, I, le I would leave this alone. Uh, now, this is a little harder to see because I do believe somebody put the white wax in there. And you can see the Krigoff proof, test proof, Krigoff proof. So it's an L2, test proof L2. This one is out of sequence, but it is all the correct proofs. So L2, L2, and then the uh, test proof. Here you see a tiny proof. Here you see a tiny proof. I believe somebody added the white wax, and in here... They did not, and these are original stamps. This is all correct. You'll notice blue here and straw here, a little blue showing up there, blue here and straw here. Um, I believe this is all correct. The grips are all correct. The finish I've already mentioned is a little bit duller, but again, if it's number one, um, it, again, it's a prototype. It would have to be a prototype, first one made. Maybe they did a few things. Uh, differently. I often talk about Krigoffs being high polish here, but the ear is dull. So high polish here and the ear is dull. But when you look at both number one and number 95, they both have an even blue on them. So evidently that was something that came a little bit, that, that configuration for the finish, I believe came a little bit later in 36. Um, I know I sound like I'm trying to defend this gun, but I've taken it all apart, um, and whoever buys this will want to take it all apart. I, am, I did not, I was not able to buy this. Uh, the owner is going to offer it for sale, but he's looking at six figures. So this is a hefty investment. This is a Krigoff Magazine non-matching 
number 95 has a Krigoff magazine that is matching. So number, uh, number 95 and number 1. But if you collect Krigoffs, you know that the G code numbering is different than the S code. The S code is different than the 36. The 36 is different than the 37. Let me just show you one example of uh, what I just talked about, about the different numbering, but these are uh, very much the same. When I take the side plate off, you'll see another dirty little secret. <laughs> this is dirty. Um, the previous owner didn't, uh, there's just a lot of grease, and in fact, the bore is just uh, filled with grease. But when I look at, take the side plate off, and you'll see a proof mark here, and this is number one. This is an L2 proof that's sideways, and this is number 95. You see L2 proof that sideways. So it's the same proof mark here. So with the side plate off on the trigger, you can see the serial number is here, 95. And it's really hard to see, and it's dirty, but there is an 01 on the trigger as well. And if you take this all the way down to the firing pin, everything is numbered and proof exactly as it should be. Whereas, when we go back to the 37, we see an L2 proof and the serial number here. So on the side plates here, they have it numbered inside and not on the, out, on the outside. And here, it's not numbered on the inside, but it is numbered on the outside. So all that is to say that as you go every year, this is why collecting Krigoffs, make sure you talk to somebody, either somebody who guarantees things and knows what they're doing, or you consult with somebody because every year they have different rules on how, they're, how they are numbered. Okay, obviously we could spend a lot more time going over this under magnification and obviously whoever buys this gun will need to check it out. It's the equivalent of uh, investing in a Singer. However, this is far more rare than a Singer unless you had Singer number one. Uh, extremely rare gun. Uh, so let me tell you a story about how I found out about this gun and then I'll have the owner of this gun tell you a little bit about how they how they acquired this gun. It's an interesting story and um, it, it goes on for a while. So uh, again, go get your favorite beverage, have a seat. Uh, but here's how I found out about this gun. I'm at the gun show and a guy came over to me I, and I'm swamped. The whole time I'm there, I have people coming up talking to me, come see this, come see this, come see this. And a guy came over, a collector friend came over, and, who, and he's a guy that I really, really trust. I think if it had been anybody else, my BS meter would have gone off. But he came over and uh, he said, he whispered in my ear with love and affection. He whispered in my ear and said, I just looked at Krigoff number one. I know the guy and I know the story behind it and it's the real deal. And I, if it had been anybody else, I would have said, uh, is it all the way at the other end of the show? Because I'm really tired. Um, I said, it's, you're sure, <laughs> are you sure? And he said, yes, it's G, G date, G code, number one, and he's had it for a long time. I'd like to introduce you. So I stopped what I was doing. I walked, it was all the way across the other end of the show. I looked at it, I talked to the guy. I went back and got Randy, my video guy, and then we came over and this is the story that we were told by the owner of uh, Krigoff number one. So, Don, how did you find this gun? Oh, thanks for asking, Don. Um, it's a really kind of a fascinating story, at least in our family. So my dad and I have been collecting militaria uh, really my whole life, and he started before that when he was a kid. His brothers, my uncles, were in the service during World War II, and they sent him souvenirs and things, and that's what started him. When he was old enough, he spent four years in Germany as part of the United States Air Force and learned the German language. He actually lived off base with a German family, collected more things while he was there. Okay. And when he came home, he actually left everything behind. He had to leave in a 24-hour notice and he, he had a collection of German helmets that he had picked up stacked around the barracks building wow. that he just left there so he could get home. And when he came home, he met my mom about three uh, weeks after he got home. They got married uh, three months later and he started a family which stopped his collecting for years. Uh, I'm actually, that happened to me too. Okay, there you go. Got married, stopped collecting. Yep. Well, I'm kid number five of five. So by the time I came around, he was starting to have a little bit of uh, leeway in his budget to be able to start doing that again. And so he really uh, started collecting in earnest in uh, 1971 when I was born. And I went to 
my first show when I was two weeks old. Wow. Uh, my mom brought me in a car seat and I was under the table. So it's really just in my blood. So fast forward to uh, it was 2002, so a little over 20 years ago. We were at a small military show in Wisconsin, which is where we're from. And uh, it was a crowded show. It's a real small show, um, all military. And we were actually doing you know, quite a bit of uh, interaction, deals, trades, and things at our table. And I saw a guy come by the table who clearly looked like he wanted to talk. He was carrying something in a, in a bag. Couldn't really tell what it was. And he leaned over to see what we had. And I eventually said, excuse me, sir, what do you have there? And he started to pull it out of the bag. And I could see it was a German Luger. Well, my dad's very favorite thing of any military was German Lugers. Uh, he got his first German Luger when he was 12 years old. It was a, a 1918 DWM. His dad bought it for him from the hardware store. And uh, he loved Lugers. And so as soon as I saw it was a Luger, uh, I asked if I could take a look at it. Um, got it in my hands and, and looked it over and said, this, this is unusual. Uh, familiar with Krieghoffs and said, it doesn't look like a normal Krieghoff, but recognized that the serial number was even more of a surprise. And so I pulled my dad's sleeve. He was talking to somebody else, said, Dad, you need to look at this. Um, he took it and started looking at it and said, this doesn't look like a Krieghoff. I said, Dad, look at the serial number. And he at first looked at it and didn't realize that it wasn't just the last two digits, which of course, you know, most of them are, right. have the last two digits all over the place. One could be the right, right, right. So I said, no, look, look, at the, look at the frame, right? Turn it around, look at the frame. Wait, did you know that Krieghoff should have plastic grips at that point? Yeah. I know. Okay, we, so the wooden grips threw you over. <clears throat> yep, yep. We had owned... Which, by the way, that's 100% correct. But go. <laughs> right, right, right. We had owned a 1937 Krieghoff. Um, oh, okay. From about, my dad um, bought it probably in about 1964 or something like that from the guy who brought okay. that one home. And so we, we had that one as kind of the model for us. And yeah, so this didn't look like that at all. The grips were different, the bluing was different, uh, didn't have that telltale thumbprint kind of on the back. And so we questioned it. And so we asked the guy, where did you come across this? Uh, the guy told us a story then and said, well, it was his father-in-law's. And told us his father-in-law brought it home from the service. And so that's okay. That seems a little bit you yeah. know, strange, but he didn't really have any reason to make that up. He had taken it to a local gun shop uh, in his local town, and they had looked at it and looked it up and said, oh, it's a Krieghoff. It ought to be worth this amount of money. And so he had come in and said, this is what I want for it. And uh, at that point in time, we said, boy, that's, you know, that is what a Krieghoff is worth, but this one doesn't look right. So right. fortunately- That's so funny. I'm just, it's just boggling. <laughs> this one doesn't look right. It doesn't look right. I understand because right. before I really studied them, yeah. I would have said, this has been messed with. Right, right. So we, we looked at it and thought, oh, it's got a, a Mauser G8 toggle on it. Somebody put a Krieghoff thing on there. It's just a parts gun. And we actually even thought about, even, a, even for parts, would it be worth something, you know, to somebody. But we passed on it. We told the guy, you know, not sure okay. it's right. Listeners, did you hear that? He passed on it. But go ahead. You're we killing did. me. We did. <laughs> uh, fortunately, we got the guy's phone number. And he, he gave us his number. <laughs> Um, we went home, we were, we were staying in a hotel, so we went to the hotel that night, and of course my dad was going in over and over his head, like, how could this be, how could this be, how could this be? And pulled through his you know, little satchel that he carried with him, whatever books he might have with him, and of course he, we didn't have any of the, the Luger books with us. And so he was struggling to try to figure it out, there's nothing, you know, in the, the blue book of gun books doesn't have anything about it. And we had um, Jan C. Still's book, um, which was Axis Pistols, right. and stuck in the back of that when he, when he shipped those out, was a, a small paper, you know, photocopied price list. And for whatever reason, we happened to flip through that price list. Yep. And on that price list, there's a single line underneath Krieghoff that says G-Date. And it didn't even have a price listed because it said, you know, so uncommon, not, right. not readily available yeah. or something like that. But it was listed there. And that triggered a thought that, holy cow, could there really be something like this? So we actually called the guy from the hotel that night. He lived about an hour and a half away and it was totally worth it. Uh, to make that extra trip, but we called the guy that night and said, you know, we've been doing a little research and we think actually it might be, it might be right. And of course the guy had adamantly said, no, this was my father-in-law, so he brought it home. And he at that point said, we've decided not to sell it. Oh. Didn't seem like anybody was really interested in it. And so he brought it home, talked to his wife, who was her dad who brought it home. And uh, she said, you know, we'll just keep it in the family. You know, nobody really wants it in the family, but since nobody else seems to want to buy it, we'll just hang on to it. So my dad at that point, you could see his, his face, he just uh, kind of got a shocked look on him, but he said, well, I really enjoyed talking with you about it. Would it be okay if I called you back in maybe three months or something like that? 
Like I said, yeah, absolutely. It was great talking to you guys. You seem real knowledgeable, so I'd love to connect with you again. So we did. So about every two months, my dad couldn't wait, quite wait three because he was so right. excited about it. But about every couple I months, I would have liked your dad. Oh, I'm sure you would have. <laughs> I'm sure you would have. Uh, about every two months, then he'd, he'd kind of work up the nerve to call the guy back. And every time, he goes, oh, great to talk to you again. No, nope, no, nope, we're going to keep it. It's all good. Well, if you ever decide to sell, yeah, 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 I got your card right here. So fast forward about two years, two years of later. steady calling. And it had been probably uh, close to six months since my dad had called him. Right. He kind of got right. a little discouraged. He wasn't wanting to sell right. it. So my dad came home that day with the encouragement of his friend, called uh, the guy with the Luger. And when he got him on the phone, he said, Don, my dad's name was Don also, he said, Don, I was just going to call you. I literally have your card in my hand, and I was going to pick up the phone and call you. And I've decided to sell the Luger. Mm. We as a family decided we're going to sell yeah. it. And my dad said, all right, let's do it. Let's, let, let's go. Yeah. This is the price? He said, yep, that's still the price. He's like, OK, let's do it. And it was, let's meet halfway. Again, he lived about, probably about five hours away from us. So it was, let's, let's go meet halfway and we'll do it. Are you available this afternoon? Yeah, let's go. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. So they did. So I was actually at work at the time, didn't know this was happening, and uh, got a call that night from my dad who said, I want you to come over to the house. I picked something up. And so I came home from work and said, well, you know, we got dinner and I got the kids and whatever. I said, no, 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 you need to come over tonight and see this thing. I'm like, well, you know, can it be tomorrow? No, you need to come tonight. I'm like, okay, something's up. So we did. My wife and I went over there with our kids and came in and the last thing I expected to see on the planet was that gun. Yeah. Of course, I recognized it immediately. Right. I'm like, He's Dad, like, what happened? Crap. And yeah. he recounted the story. So we, we had it. And at that point, it was, OK, now how do we confirm this? Because um, by that point, we had tried to dig through other books and say what, what's known about these. And we had talked to a really, really uh, close friend who knew some things about Lugers and sort of rare variations. And he had really directed us to the Randall Gibson book right. on Krieghoffs. And we had seen it, but you know, didn't own enough Krieghoffs to, to make it worth owning one. Uh, but at that point, of course, we said we need to find one. Got a copy of that, uh, went through that, and then actually uh, reached out to Randall. And I don't remember if the first contact was over phone or mail, um, but it, somehow we, we reached out to him. Yeah. He's in Texas, I believe. I, I, probably, yeah, I, don't, okay. I don't remember. Uh, yeah. uh, my dad was, was doing all that correspondence at the time. And he had, he had then, my dad reached out to him, had a phone conversation with him. And in that phone conversation, he, he said to my dad, don't say anything. I'm gonna ask you questions. And I, you need to answer yes or no about these specific things. And he wanted to ascertain right. over the phone if he could, you know, how close it was to what it should be. And he got through with that a series of questions and came back with, well, I think you got something here. Okay. And so from that point, we, we did take some pictures. We sent him pictures through the mail. And he said to us, he said, I really want to see it. Obviously, I want to have it in my hands. I want to take it apart. He said, I, from what it sounds like, I think it's right. But I want to, I want to hold it in my hands and inspect right. it. So we arranged actually to meet him here at the show shows. I'd have to dig out uh, the, the correspondence from that of when that took place. Uh, but I actually have a photograph of the two of them together at the show shows holding the gun. Randall Gibson and your Randall dad. Gibson and my dad. And uh, just a cool thing that actually that photograph, so this was before digital photography. So that photograph, you know, we printed that on paper and everything from film. And uh, that was printed, we made two copies of it. One actually was on my dad's desk in his gun room. He had kind of yeah. sitting right next to him. The other one actually made it to the uh, refrigerator in the kitchen with the family pictures. So uh, all the grandkids like are up there. The picture of the, and Randall the Gibson with my dad in the yeah. yeah, it was in the, was in the kitchen. So I believe I have two copies of that buried away someplace. Okay. So that's the story of how it uh, came out of the work. What we found out later, uh, we kept up correspondence with the family because they we really did hit it off with them. Um, the, the guy who captured it and brought it home, he was actually in the 705th Tank Destroyer Battalion. They were one of the, the few tank destroyer units that was actually at uh, Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. And the, the story that the veteran told his family and that they passed on to us was that at a lull in that battle, um, he crawled out to a, a body that was there in the field and took the Luger for himself and, and brought it back. And you know, our sort of investigation around that was that, well, Krieghoff Lugers, typically used by Luftwaffe, um, most of who was at Bastogne was not Luftwaffe in that right. battle. But we did do the research to find that there was a unit, a regiment of Fallschirmjäger, the German paratroopers, that was there. 
And when we look to see where they, um, where they attacked, where their units attacked around Bastogne, and where the 705th Tank Destroyer Battalion was, that actually does match up. So okay. that's not necessarily provenance exactly, but it is sort of yeah. at least cor corresponding history that would seem to corroborate that. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, this is the beauty and the uh, randomness of a gun show. If you walk down his table and everything at this table is blades, daggers, there's not a gun on his table. <laughs> and so for me to come to this show for 10 years, you've probably been here for 10 years. 18 years, this is our 18th years. year. So yeah. I've been here at 10 to 12 years. We've never met, because I never stopped at this table. I never would have known had it not been for a mutual acquaintance and yeah. said, um, my mutual acquaintance, he, he loves legacy. We've done a lot of yep. business together. So yep. he recommended us. And I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. We'll take good care of your treasure. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>